the floor! Because you hit every other damn thing out there, I want you to be perfect! When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. It's him. He talks to me. Good evening, race fans. Welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network and welcome to Drafting the Circuits. My name is Frank Santoroski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we talk over uh, racing this week. And next, um, joining me in the studio, I've got my regular panels, Louise Torres and Richard Uden. Guys, how are we doing tonight? Good, thank you. It's almost April. It's almost April. Yeah, April Fool's Day tomorrow. So you might be fooled, might still be March. Uh, you never know. Um, we've also got a special guest waiting in the wings. I've got John Oriovitz, writer, author, journalist. Um, John has a very, if, if you've followed racing over the last 20, 30 years, you know the name John Oriovitz. He's written for ESPN, he's written for um, Autosport. He's, uh, he's, he's had contributions to the uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway race program. Um, he's worked with uh, Pac West, and he's got two new books on the market. The, one of those is called Time Flies, The History of Pac West Racing. And then the new book, which was going to come to press, it's coming to press May 15th, I believe, is called Indie Split. Now, John, welcome. Hello, Frank, and thanks for allowing me to join you fellows tonight. Well, it's great to have you on. Before we start talking about your book, I'll just knock out the racing headlines uh, real quick. Um, Bristol Dirt, um, nearly a failed experiment with uh, with the weather that we saw on Saturday and Sunday, but they did manage to get the race in Monday. Opinions are split on whether it was a train wreck or whether it was fun to watch. I thought it was fun to watch. At the end of the day, it was Joey Logano uh, taking the win there. And earlier in the day, the trucks, uh, Martin Truex um, won the truck race there. Uh, Formula One, uh, same old, same old. Uh, Lewis Hamilton winning the race, but uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, Max Verstappen is ready to come after Lewis this year, not make it quite so easy. I mean, we're used to seeing Lewis Hamilton listed as a winner at the end of the day, but uh, it was not a given, not a given for sure. And we'll get we'll get into that later on. Uh, but John, let's talk about the book Indie Split. Now this. The topic of the split is it really this many years later, it's still a very sensitive subject for some folks. You can reactions range from total disgust to anger uh, to, you know, people that feel like they still need to take a side after all these years. Now, uh, John, you and I are close to the same age, which means that we both live through this thing. We're both old enough to have started watching racing in the seventies. Uh, before the first indie split, but um, your book doesn't just cover the split, but you kind of, uh, you pick it up right about 1945 when the Holmans buy the Speedway in the first place. No, that's, that's right. And it's sure. The focus of the book is on the so-called split, which is what people referred to the, the clash between uh, cart and the Indy racing league between 1994 or 96 up to 2008. But to tell the story of of why that happened, you have to tell the story of the the 1979 to 1981 split between CART and USAC, the original split, as it were. And and the fact that it didn't get resolved properly, uh, it just kind of hung in the air for 15 years until the IRL kind of uh, dropped a bomb on it and kind of blew it out into the open. Um, But to tell the story of the 79 split, you have to really explain the philosophical differences that led to that, uh, which means going back to the rear engine revolution in the 60s and and USAC's governance of the sport in the 70s, which led to the dissatisfaction amongst the competitors and the reasons that CART was formed. The rear engine revolution in the 60s was the, the philosophical conflict, almost the Democrats versus Republicans, if you will, of, of IndyCar racing. So you need to talk about the rear engine revolution. You need to talk about the Holman's gaining power through forming USAC. And so ultimately ground zero, the day where it all begins is the day that Tony Holman bought the speedway in November, 1945. Uh, The Holman's didn't set out to run IndyCar racing or govern the sport, but they ended up in a position where the, the responsibility almost fell into their laps and 
they just there was always kind of an une uneasy relationship with the competitors, certainly starting in the 60s once Lotus and, and the rear engine folks came in. All right, now you mentioned the, the USAC. Um, now, USAC was its own entity, uh, but, but you kind of alluded to that, uh, that the homeless kind of controlled USAC. Well, the, the sanctioning body for the Indianapolis 500 and most forms of American racing correct, was, was the AAA the auto club as we know it now uh they had a, a competition board that that started sanctioning the indy 500 in 1911 all the way up through 1955 and in 1955 it was a terrible year for racing uh alberto ascari got killed the great formula one champion uh bill vukovic who had won the indy 500 the previous two years was killed during the indy 500 while leading in 1955 and then, of course, there was the, the 24 hours of Le Mans tragedy where the Mercedes went into the crowd and killed 80 people. So the AAA pulled out of racing at that point in, as an immediate result of these events. And Tony Holman, given the fact that the sanction for the Indy 500 was going away, Tony Holman took over sanctioning responsibilities. He formed USAC, or he was certainly one of the key people uh, informing USAC. He put up the seed money. The Speedway provided their offices in downtown Indianapolis. And from that time on, from 1956, um, honestly, up through the 90s in the IRL, the Speedway and USAC were intrinsically linked. They were, you know, they, they weren't, they were one and the same. There was very little separation between church and state there. You know, kind of like the current situation we have now. We've got the, the the owner of the speedway still is the, the owner of, of the series. Yeah. So, and, and, and the, you know, they, they're located across the street from each other here on 16th street and they still might as well be 5,000 miles apart. Yeah, absolutely. Now when we talk about cart, I mean, I, I vividly remember the, 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 the cart opening up and one, I went to one of the first cart races uh, that was held. Uh, at Watkins Glen in 1979, and I was, I, I was fairly much immediately impressed with the cars themselves. Prior to that, I had been to the Formula One race uh, out there at the Glen, uh, and I'd been to a couple of sports car races at Lime Rock. Uh, you know, go to the Formula One race, I didn't meet a single Formula One driver, right? I went to this kart race, and, and I met nearly all the drivers there. And this is me as an 11-year-old kid thinking this is just phenomenal. So I was kind of hooked on that, but it's, it's kind of amazing how quickly um, cart gained momentum. Um, and, and then USAC kind of lost events rather quickly. I, I vividly remember going to the Pocono 500 in 1981, uh, which was one of the few USAC holdouts and they're, they're then putting sprint cars uh, and silver crown cars on the track to fill the field. <laughs> Uh, it's, one until of the it, lower moments in USAC history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but uh, there are a lot of folks that um, really feel that uh, CART was on the right path and they were very strong. But, but behind the scenes, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks that will tell you, and I'm of this opinion too, that they were horribly mismanaged uh, and because of their kind of management by committee. Would, would you agree, disagree? Or, I mean, they were almost successful in spite of themselves in the 80s. Um, what made cart successful is, is, is they benefited from the, f the failure or the end of the, the new Can-Am series. So they got a bunch of teams like Newman Haas and Green and Forsyth and the likes. They also, as these races in Formula 5000 and the Can-Am went under these tracks, Laguna Seca, Mid-Ohio, Road America, they needed to pick up events. So it all kind of came together magically for CART in the 80s. They picked up the Long Beach Grand Prix when Formula One decided not to run there anymore. Um, yeah, did it, what, did it for Detroit. Hey, well, that's you know, <laughs> one of the more glorious street circuits. Yeah. But what, what you ended up with with CART in the 80s and into the 90s was you ended up with this fantastic mix of, of the best of Formula One with higher technology cars, with international stars, Emerson Fittipaldi, Nigel Mansell, Teo Favi, uh, going up against the best elements of, of traditional IndyCar racing, oval tracks, Indianapolis, Phoenix, Milwaukee, Pocono, uh, the Unsers, the Andrettis, Bobby Rahal, Rick Mears, Danny Sullivan. And so for this fantastic period um, 
in the 80s and into the 90s, kart was the best of all worlds of American racing and international racing. And it was reflected. The grandstands were packed. The sponsorship was, uh, you know, it was huge. Um, and unfortunately, it just didn't resonate with Tony George and what appeared to be a dwindling traditional grassroots oval track fan base. Right, which is essentially the reason why Tony George wanted to um, branch out on his own, flex his muscle, if you will. But I mean, you can argue that, um, you know, Cart uh, is no more. So therefore, they were the loser of the split. But if you think about it, Tony George's vision of an all oval series that would help American circle track drivers get to the Indy 500 is also dead in the water. No, that, that didn't, that never happened. And it was, I'm sure it was, uh, I'm sure Tony meant well, and it was, it was genuine, but the bottom line is, is that the, the ship on USAC drivers becoming IndyCar stars sailed in the seventies. You know, honestly, you look back to that great generation of drivers of, of the answers and Mario and Foyt, Gordon Johncock and Lloyd Ruby and all those, all these guys that came out of USAC in the sixties, USAC really didn't produce any major stars in the seventies. Um, you know, Poncho Carter, no disrespect, but um, you know, he, he wasn't exactly Al Unser or Mario Andretti. And, and this systemic failure, you could possibly trace it to when USAC, dropped dirt races from the so-called championship car schedule in 1971. They dropped road racing at the same time. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons for it, but there was this disconnect between um, USAC grassroots racing and the Indy 500. And Tony George, one of his stated goals was to protect oval racing and grow oval racing and grassroots racing. And, and maybe it was genuine and I think it was, but it just, it was, it was never going to work. It had already failed during the cart era for 15 years, 20 years up to that point. So I don't think it's a surprise that it didn't happen. And there were a few guys that slipped through the cracks, Tony Stewart being the obvious, obvious example. But in general, that part of the IRL experiment didn't work. And, and uh, to this day, the, the USAC series, they're, they're the feeder series for NASCAR. Yeah, if you want to uh, race in the Indy 500 one day, you're much much better off starting out in shifter carts and then going to like the SCCA and Formula V or Formula Ford, maybe doing a skip barber and going up that way um, and really, you know, learn that. And that's where that's where the guys come from. Even even these guys that go spend a couple of years in Europe, um, they're coming back with great skills. Um, but but the interesting thing about the cart era um, at, at that time, the uh, say the the 90s, you know, prior to the split cart was a legitimate springboard into formula one, which is something that does not exist today because the cars are so wildly different right now than they were. But if you, if you look at, uh, you know, like, like Michael, um, Jacques Villeneuve, uh, Zanardi, um, Montoya, um, Damata, all those guys jumped right from winning the cart championship into formula one. But now it's like, now there's so much more of a disconnect between, the, the Indy IndyCar series and Formula One. Yeah, between the between the commercial decline of IndyCar racing starting in the second half of the 90s. And then let's face it, um, of all the guys that went went over there, and you can list seven or eight of them if you include Sebastian Bourdais, um, Jacques Villeneuve and, and Montoya were the guy, only guys that had any type of success. And some of the guys that went over, they were great over here. The cars over here were bigger. They weren't, they didn't react as quickly. They're not as nimble and, and, you know, lightning reflex as a formula one car. And as you know, in formula one, unless you're in the top two, maybe three teams, the odds are stacked against you to have any type of success. So Villeneuve went to a good team when it was on top and, and he got the results. He won the championship. Uh, the rest of those guys, you know, by the time Zanardi got to Williams, they were in considerable decline. He never had a fair shot there. Bourdais said that he just couldn't drive the the Toro Rosso car. And and um, he told him that. He said, if I can't drive this car, if you're not going to change it and help me drive it, then you might as well hire somebody else. And they did halfway through the season. Uh, Montoya did pretty well. 
Montoya Williams was kind of on the upswing when he got over there and he won some races and, and who can forget that moment in the Brazilian Grand Prix in his first or second race where he put the move on Michael Schumacher and, and uh, nobody had seen that in F1 for a number of years. That was great. But in general, the, the record of people going from cart to formula one, it's just, it's not glittery and IndyCar racing kind of got a bad reputation. And, and it's interesting that now it's, it's kind of starting to come back a little bit now that you see Roman Grosjean coming over here and, um, Marcus Erickson, it's becoming more of a destination for these European guys who are kind of at a crossroads in their careers. Um, and, and we can only hope, given the fact that it has now been nearly 43 years since an American won a Formula One race. Mario Andretti won the 1978 Dutch Grand Prix. That's the last time an American won in Formula One. As, as an American auto racing fan, I mean, I'm embarrassed by that. Um, I can't believe that that this country hasn't produced a driver with the desire or the skill to to contend for formula one race wins in more than 40 years. That's it's, I don't know. That's just a stunning statistic. Yeah. And you've got, you've got guys that, uh, that have tried like Rossi Rossi's a perfect example. He was, you know, he's there at the the bottom of the grid in, in, you know, formula one as a test driver, getting an occasional start here and there. Uh, But he's very, very talented young guy. Uh, he, he comes over here and then he's, uh, you know, instantly he's successful. Uh, but at the same time, he's enjoying it so much more. You know, if, if, you, if you talk to Rossi, he'll tell you, oh, yeah, there's, there's no going back. You know, the funny thing about Rossi is when he came over here in 2016, he didn't really have any choice. His Formula One uh, ride went away. Right. And he wasn't happy about it. He, you know, it was a, it was a forced move it was clear that he didn't want to be here. And then he kind of stumbled into winning the Indy 500 and he had to kind of come to terms with the fact that his career was going to be in Indy cars. And to his credit, since then, he, he got it together. He, he put the right attitude into it and he's become a race winner and a, and a, an important guy to the series, both in terms of his character and, and the role that he plays on the track where he's not afraid to bump wheels with people and kind of be the bully a little bit. You know, it's it's interesting you talk about this. You know the the differences between you know trying to get a successful U.S. driver into Formula One, and you know I've been around you know Formula One drivers in the UK, and I've been around you know some of the NASCAR guys over here, and and even a couple of the IndyCar guys. Yeah, and, and then this is something that we, I've talked about with people in the past, but I, I'm I'm a pretty firm believer actually that it's actually it's a cultural thing. And it's not just Formula One on, on motor racing. It's sport in general in Europe is run and managed very, very differently to what it is in the US. Now, you're starting to see it a little bit more in um, NASCAR and IndyCar in the US. But take, you know, football, and I'm referring to the the American football here, you know, you guys go through high school, go through college, and then they turn professional at 21, 22. And that's pretty much similar with all sports in the US. Now in the UK, for example, our football or soccer, if you're not professionally signed up to a team at 12, 13 years old, you're never going to be successful. Now you look at guys like Lewis Hamilton, they were well known in the racing circles at 12, 13, 14 years old. And they were being pushed into that mentality and that work ethic and that exposure that to a certain extent is you don't see that here. Now you're starting to see that I think with, um, uh, um, um, and um, heard as kid in IndyCar now, it's starting to get that way where you're seeing these young kids. But you know, you look at guys like Max Verstappen, he was a Formula One driver at 17 years old, you know, and undoubtedly, you know, a, a phenomenal talent at that age. I, I think that mentality in the US has to change for, excuse me, for them to become successful in Europe and, and really go, go after it and be 
100% committed to the sport in Europe. Because in Europe, as a kid, you will be associated to a professional sports team and they will provide you your education. Whereas I think in the US more, you'll go to high school and have your education and they'll provide you with the sport. So it's it's that balance. And of course, it's not an issue in the US because everybody's the same for their major sports. So there's no harm. But in Europe, it's a lot more competitive. And it, it, it's interesting looking at that cultural difference there. Well, I think you're right, Richard, um, that there is a significant cultural difference between, I mean, we'll limit to motorsports here, but American race car drivers, and I won't necessarily restrict it to England or Europe, but international race car drivers. Yeah. I would say that, you know, and, and there's this myth about, you know, these foreign ride buyers that came into IndyCar racing. Well, I, I wouldn't classify them as foreign ride buyers. I would classify them as race car drivers who understood earlier than their American counterparts that there's more to being a race car driver than driving the car and that yeah. they were willing to go out and do the necessary work to put together some of the business elements necessary to fund their program. Mm -hmm. I think that there is... Um, a laziness amongst American drivers to sit around and wait for the phone to ring and wait for the offer to come in. Yeah. European I mean, American drivers don't have. And the, the last comment I'd make toward this about the cultural differences is that I think that in NASCAR and Richard, you're probably familiar with this, that Toyota is making an effort to uh, control the careers of drivers from a very yeah. young age. And I would say that Christopher Bell is probably the most prominent yeah. example of that right now. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and, you know, you look at the almost ruthless nature that Toyota has been handling some of their drivers and you look at Daniel Suarez and Eric Jones that, you know, they've not done anything wrong. They're just not good enough in their eyes. And you, you have about go. a two year window once once yeah. you move to the cup level. If, if you're not championship material, it seems you're you're left aside. Yeah. And and the you know and in Formula One it, it's similar you know uh, but there's other other drivers and I, I've been around some you know young drivers in in NASCAR and you know they're they're one of the good old boys and and they'll you know they go into the you know I'm not going to name anybody any drivers here but you know I've seen some of them in the gym for an hour and a half and they've been more bothered about what songs are playing on the radio than actually working out and if a Formula One boss saw somebody do that they'd be out instantly. Well, you know, and, there's just no room for that mentality. No, I mean, with, I worked with, at, with uh, Toyota. I, I say, well, why do they hang on to Denny Hamlin when they could have Eric Jones? But that's just me. Yeah, I still. Yeah. yeah, that's a shame that they let Eric Jones go the way it did, because that was their guy. Of course, they have Christopher Bell, pretty much their guy now that represents Toyota. But they're in a situation where they have so many talented drivers that some of them had to, they had to give up. I like, namely Kyle Larson. They had to Larson went elsewhere because there's just not much room for it. And Ford yeah. who have Chase Briscoe and Haley Deegan, they have, they have few folks so they can focus on just those rather They have like dozens of dozens out there. I think that's kind of like the identity concern that Toyota has right now, whereas Ford are doing so far so good in some aspects. That's a good observation, yeah. Luis. Yeah, I mean, just as I finally give you, you know, one example. I, you know, I was lucky enough to work for the Williams Formula One team, and, and before my time there, uh, you know, you, you hear these stories and anecdotal stories, and I'm sure there's a lot of truth in them. But um, there was a, you know, in the early 2000s, there was a young test driver that was driving for Williams, and he was five minutes late to a promotional you know, think one of the sponsors and he got back to the, the factory there and Frank Williams made this guy cry. You know, he just ripped him to pieces. Yeah, and, Patrick. you know, then you have Kyle Bush, you know, just being like, oh, I don't want to do an interview and walking off. You know, oh, that, it's that mentality and it's that attitude that works over here because that's what the fans want. And I think, you know, th th these guys really need to look at what do they want. If they want to make it to Formula One, they they cannot i personally don't think they can do it in this environment because it's too i'm gonna i don't want to use the word toxic that sounds very dramatic but it just doesn't it's a pressure cooker how's that yeah you know the the, the, the pressure on a kid in europe is far far higher than it is here to succeed 
I think Joseph Newgarden of, of the of the American drivers, and and obviously he spent a couple of years over there in Europe, so he's yep. familiar with it. Um, yep. I think that he would be capable of handling the Formula One pressure, but again, he's thirty years old now, and it's just it's not. Yeah. Good for him. He's if he was twenty, no. there might still be a possibility. But, and that's the know, thing; they don't, you know, it takes well, them well. until they're 22, 23, 24 before people start taking notice of them. And that's almost middle aged by Formula One driver standards now. Yep, exactly. And of course, McLaren's just signed this thirteen-year-old. They coach. have, yeah, yeah. yeah I saw that, and he, I think that's and he's he's yeah. Ameri- American, actually, correct? Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Maybe that maybe that's our next American driver there. I mean, we you know we we're have- referring to Jack Crawford or somebody else. No. I can't remember his name off the top of his head. Off the top of my so head, no, Jack um... Crawford is also in the mix as well. Maybe making it the formula. Yeah, I mean, there's a few good guys coming through, but again, you know, it, it's that, I don't want to use the word desire, because I'm sure all these guys have the same amount of desire, but it's the, it is certainly a very, very different environment, and it's difficult, you know, it's, it's difficult for guys that, you know, you as I say, you've got to be involved in these teams at 12, 13 years old, and it's difficult to to move country potentially and and do all that sort of stuff at a young age um and i I personally don't think you'll ever see a a guy come through the junior ranks in the u.s and make it to formula one i think they're gonna they would have to be in europe to be successful yeah you've got to do that british formula four no sort of things you know we have you know connor daly went over to europe for a while as did a new garden uh santino ferrucci went over to europe for a while So those guys, yeah, they all they all gain some uh, some great skill and whatnot there. But I want to I want to circle back to the split again and talk about the early IRL. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> uh, that's okay. No, that's okay. It's all it's all good stuff we're talking about. Um, right, it's a relief for me to talk about something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, no, I, I mean the, the early IRL. A lot of uh, a lot of the folks that were cart loyalists, um, you know, and I, I I use that term because at the time you felt like you had to take a side, but there are there are guys out there who who have had careers that they would not have had, uh, and I'm talking guys like like a Greg Ray, like a Billy Boat, like a Buddy Lazier, um, these guys who uh, were, were were able to race at you know top level racing. I see where you're going, and here's yeah. one on to that: Alex Zanardi and Greg Moore never raced in the Indy 500. Mark Blundell never raced in the Indy 500. Correct. So, yeah. So you had, had right. And some guys were denied a chance. Yeah. So yeah. So it goes both ways. So now, um, John, what's the um? Are there any like uh, really crazy telling revelation revelations in your book that that we're just going to be surprised with? Uh, I know you've uh, you, you know you've uh, you've been immersed in the sport for for the you know what are the, I mean what are the what are the juicy bits of the books that uh, that you'd like to talk about i think the most surprising thing is that i think irl loyalists will hopefully come away thinking that i was a bit kinder and more compassionate toward tony george and their side than they expect going in um you know i i I, writing this book was a to me it was a great responsibility this is something i've followed very passionately since i was 13 years old and that was a long time ago that's three quarters of my life and um, I was never a cart guy per se. I liked the formula that cart turned into, like I mentioned earlier with its blend of international and American racing, but I never loved cart, the organization or Andrew Craig or Bill Stokan or any of the leaders individually. I just liked their vision for IndyCar racing and their vision for IndyCar racing included the Indy 500. And it's unfortunate that, that, uh, that, there was just this shocking lack of respect between the speedway and cart because they both helped each other and they didn't understand and acknowledge how they helped each other. And as a result, they hurt each other. Um, and so my, you know, my take on all this is that you might think that I have some kind of slant, but everything that I've done has been for the love of the sport. All I want to see is I want to see IndyCar racing succeed. I don't care whether the Speedway runs it or Tony George or Andrew Craig or Carter, whoever. I just wanted to see the sport succeed. Um, A lot of livelihoods and careers uh, were in the balance because of this mismanagement of the sport and this conflict. 
and I think everybody, whether no matter what side they were on, has a love of IndyCar racing. They just have a different vision for what IndyCar racing should be. And it's, you know, it's, it's taken all these years for it to shake out um, to what it is, what it is now, which is essentially the old kart series but being run by the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah, it's, it's funny how we've almost gone full, full circle there. But uh, I am looking forward to reading your book because for, for what you just said, like there's no slant. I've always found your writing in particular to be quite balanced. Uh, you know, w- when you compare it to a guy like uh, Robin Miller, who I love to death, uh, puts a lot of his own personality in there, or a guy like Marshall Pruitt, who I also love to death, but he puts a lot of technical stuff in there that, that loses some of the casual readers. But I've always find the stuff that you've written to be just very balanced, you know? And so I, I, I'm really looking forward to reading this book and the book is through Octane Press. Is that correct? That's right. Octane Press. And, and I'll make two quick comments on your last remark there. All right. Uh, number one, Robin wrote the forward to my book. I don't know if that tells you anything. Well, I mean, you know, you and Robin have been uh, working together for a long time. I, Robin was, when, when I was a teenager getting into this stuff, you know, yes, Rick Mears was my race driver hero, but my heroes were the, were the journalists that were out there covering this stuff. And for guys like Robin Miller and Gordon Kirby and Nigel Roebuck uh, to be my friends now and, and colleagues, it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, That's a name I haven't heard for a while. Nigel Roebuck. Wow. Uh, he was one of my early inspirations. I, my yeah. parents would travel to England and bring back car magazines as, as my souvenirs and, even as a kid, I fell in love with the guy's writings and you know, he wasn't afraid to have a take. He didn't like, no, nope. he did like Jill Villeneuve and he wasn't afraid to show it. And to me, that's always been part of good journalism is, is, is have a take and don't suck is what Jim, what Jim Rome would say, but to, but yep. to have a take and, and not be afraid to put your name and your face out there with it. Um, it, it takes courage to, to take a stance and comment on things these days and do it with your name on it and not, yep. you know, IRL fan four six two two four or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> and, and too many people just re- regurgitate a press release and throw it on the WordPress page and call it a uh, you know call it a racing. Well, site. I appreciate your compliment. The other thing I was going to yeah. say is that Fred Nation, the longtime PR man for in Indiana politics for Evan By and Birch By, going back to the seventies, but who was who was the mouthpiece for IndyCar and and the Speedway uh, during a lot of the split years. Fred Nation paid me one of the nicest compliments ever. Is he's like Oreo? You're critical, but you're fair, and and I've always that's what I've always I've never tried to be critical. I've always just tried to make fair and informed commentary. But the 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 key is is I've always tried to keep it fair and and not um, throw any pipe bombs into the mix. No, I, and again, that's that's one of the things I appreciate about appreciate about reading what you have to write. So now you were with ESPN for a, a long time, uh, 14 years, yeah. Yeah, a decade and a half almost. Yeah. And then you there, you know, ESPN decided to just do massive cuts across the board and they let a lot of talented people go, you being among them. So is the, the, you know, spare time you had on your hands was, was that the impetus to really uh, dig into writing these two books or, or have you always had in the back of your mind uh, that you were going to do these books at one point in time? Well, it's funny that you bring up ESPN and I'm grateful to ESPN for the platform that I had for all that time. Um, it's, it's definitely an education about how valuable your affiliation is. Um, but the, certainly the genesis for the split book came for something I wrote for ESPN in 2011 um, at the time of the 100th anniversary of the first Indy 500. I wrote a 10 part series kind of decade by decade doing the history of the Indy 500 and the PAC West book time flies. That was, that's a long standing project. As you, as you might've mentioned, I worked uh, two years as PR for the PAC West team in the cart series in 97 and 98 with Mauricio Gujuman, Big Mo and Mark Blundell. And a few years after I, I left the team to go back into the media, Bruce McCaw asked me to put together a history of the team. And um, life happens. And so that, that project was put on the back burner for a lot of years. And when 2017 happened to me, I, I reached out to Bruce and I said, hey, let's, let's finish the Pac West book. And 
at that point, I'd started working on the split book. And I said, you know, hey, are you interested in, in supporting this project? And this this project, the Indie Split Book, would not be possible without Bruce McCaw's support. Um, he cares deeply about the history of auto racing, um, among other things. The guy's a pretty interesting guy. But he believes, uh, you know, he believed in IndyCar racing enough to be a team owner in it for 10 years. And he, he believes that this story needs to be told. And based on the reaction that I've seen in the couple of weeks since the book's been been released, which has been overwhelming, he's right. Um, and I'm so grateful that uh, that there was somebody who had the means and the desire to, to get this out there in the public domain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bruce is certainly a good dude. Um, now, uh, let, let's talk about the Pat West book a little bit. Now, are you are you starting from like the very impetus of the start of the team and, and you go year by year or. Yeah. And the interesting thing about the Pac West book is that it indirectly tells the story of the end of cart, because here's a team that came in in 1993 at the height of the cart era during Nigel Mansell's championship season. They had all the resources and people that you could hope for. And it just showed that a series of events, whether it was the split, whether it was Mercedes Benz, Ilmore trying to do a radical engine that was a step too far, (laughs) whether it was not changing engines in a timely manner to keep your sponsors when you weren't competitive. It just showed how quickly it can go good and go bad for a racing team. Um, The thing I'm most proud of and Again, I'm grateful to Bruce for this because this, you know, the book could have been a press release, but it's not. It is a warts and all story. It is a true story of of how a racing team is built and is dismantled. And the fact that the, you know, the whole cart storyline going along with it, the, the decline of cart and how much that factored into the decline of Pac West, it's just, it's a very interesting sub theme to the book. Um and people say, you know, ah, Pac West, what did they do? They won a handful of races. Well, yeah, but, you know, Mauricio Guzman was one of the best guys on super speedways in the 90s. You, you wonder how he would have done had he been able to run the Indy 500 in the late in the latter half of the 90s. Mark Blundell won a race at Fontana. You wonder how he would have done. Pac West launched Scott Dixon's IndyCar career. He won his first race for them at Nazareth in 2001. Some great people work for the team. John Anderson, Ziggy Harkis, Steve Fusick, who's Takuma Sato's manager now. Um, It it was a great team. And and, um, at the time that I worked there in 97 and 98, I was really fortunate to be there for the really successful year when Mark and Mauricio won four races and got a bunch of poles and everything. I didn't appreciate it at the time because I wanted to be a journalist and I'd taken a, a PR job as kind of a fallback because I needed to work and make money. And now I look back on those two years as, you know, maybe two of the most important years in my career, because it taught me that the sport wasn't so much a sport. It taught me the whole business side of it. It showed me how a racing team works from the inside. Um, Unbelievable lifelong connections, whether it's Bruce McCaw or the drivers, Mauricio and Mark, Scott Dixon, who wasn't there when I was there, but they always made me an honorary team member. So I was always around. Um, just really great times and, and uh, really happy and evocative memories of a great era because, you know, in 97 and 98, cart was still flying high. I mean, the crowds were huge. We were traveling all over the world, successful events, sweet cars, uh, great driver lineup. It, it was just, it was a, for me as a kid that grew up loving IndyCar racing, whether it's been as a fan or as a journalist or PR or whatever, just to, to have been so close to it all for 40 plus years now, it's, it's just been a real privilege. Oh, certainly. I can imagine. Now, John, whatever happened to the, say the assets of Pac West, were those, do those go to another team or, or whether they just sold off or. Cause I know sometimes when these teams fold up, somebody else will pick up the pieces. Um, there was a succession plan for Bruce to pass the team al- along to the team members. And a lot of that was based on the value of the cart stock that the team owned, which turned to nothing. The assets ended up with uh, Russ Cameron, who was the team manager for PacWest in the latter years. 
And Russ ended up teaming up with Kevin Kalkoven and Craig Pollock in 2003. So Pac West actually turned into PK Racing, which turned into PKV Racing, which turned into KV Racing. So the you know the the lineage of Pac West, you can you can take it all the way up to 2016 or 17, I believe it is. And Tony Kanan won the Indy 500 for that team. Um, Sebastian Bourdais won several races for them. And the whole time up until uh, Cal Coven pulled out in 16 or 17, they operated out of the old building that Pac West built up on the northwest, northwest side of Indianapolis. So it, it did kind of carry on. Uh, the legacy of it did carry on, um, you know, notably through KV Racing and Scott Dixon. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I was at Dixon's win in uh, Nazareth and I was like, well, who's this kid? <laughs> but uh, yeah, we all know who he is now for sure. So now, Richard, Louise, you have any uh, any questions for John before we start talking about the races this weekend? Yeah, the one that I had in mind was what you guys were talking about the Americas, just like in the F one, having won in over four decades, and also just the the split in general from the the late seventies. Where do you just simply stand? Where about the title sponsorship or deal? Because of course, Marlboro was there, the part of the championship trail, and then Viceroy kind of send Marlboro packing straight to formula one sponsoring drivers and teams. You felt like had that relationship continue on and none of the whole vice Roy thing caused so much friction. Maybe it would have grown the sport because I've heard many people say it would have easily grown the sport further. Well, you've done your homework there, Luis. Um, and that, that is covered in one of the early chapters in my book here. Oh, nice. Um, at the same time that Winston came on as the title sponsor of the NASCAR Grand National Series, which was renamed the Winston Cup in 1971. Marlboro sponsored the USAC Championship Trail. And then one year into that, as you correctly pointed out, Viceroy, and, and you know, who smokes Viceroy's these days? Um, Viceroy cigarettes came in in a, in a big splashy way as the sponsor of Al Unser and Mario Andretti uh, in a team affiliated with Parnelli Jones. And it, it forced Marlboro out. Marlboro believed that contractually that no other tobacco company could come in and, and USAC didn't stand up for them. And as a result, Marlboro left and Marlboro came back and it was, you know, ironically enough, given all the talk about foreigners and all that, it was Emerson Fittipaldi who brought them back. Um, Emerson Fittipaldi had a relationship with Philip Morris International through his uh, Formula One years with McLaren and then as a personal services deal up until he, when he retired in 80 or 81. But he maintained his contacts with Philip Morris. And when he got serious about an IndyCar career uh, in 86, it was Emerson Fittipaldi that made the Philip Morris USA sponsorship happen. And then of course he took it to Penske in 1990. So I do think that that's a very significant event. It's, you know, it's, it's a footnote, obviously it's a very small thing. And, and that's why this is a 450 page book. That's just full of thousands of these little things that, that hopefully I haven't forgotten too many. But this is an important one. Um, IndyCar potentially had really, really amazing support. I mean, by the end, Winston was spending, I believe the number was $17.5 million a year on NASCAR. And it, it was synonymous. I mean, everywhere you went, the tracks were red and white for Winston. Um, it was a highly, highly, highly successful program for RJ Reynolds. And, and you can only speculate and, and, and figure that, yeah, it, it would have had a positive impact on IndyCar racing, I think. You think where we at right now, what energy drinks is, do you feel like it's still a long ways to go or you feel like it's sort of on bar? Because based on what I see, look retrospectively, it seems like tobacco products were like the elite tier status of product of money. Now, without it, it's pretty much now back to like views or just the aforementioned energy drink products where it's helped some, but it's impact wise. I'm not sure. I guess the energy drinks are the modern day vice, Um, but they just, you know, Red Bull's a phenomenon. Monster has been pretty successful in this country, but I don't think that they have the, the bankroll that that the tobaccos companies did certainly in their heyday when, when Mm -hmm. everybody and their brother smoked. Right. And and, and then of course, you know, motor racing was one of the few avenues that, that tobacco companies had to get their name out there. They're, you know, banned from yep. magazine advertising and um, you know, television advertising. So 
Yeah, I mean, this day and age, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the sponsorship you see are these business to business deals, you know, where they're not, they're not necessarily marketing a consumer product. And, but, oh, I hear your cat, John. Yeah, he's, he, he, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Well, his name's Baxter, right? No, Baxter's, Baxter's departed. This one's, um, he, he came to me as Clayton. He was pre-named. I call him Clay after Clay Regazzoni, one of my early favorite races. <laughs> Oh, nice. I love Clay Regazzoni. Yeah. So, um, uh, <laughs> I just totally lost my train of thought. Thank you, Clay. I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the 12 year old, I'm the 12 year old kid in Indianapolis in 1977. The only person in the joint cheering for Clay Regazzoni. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean that, you know, tobacco money's long gone and these, these different sponsorship deals are, and, and every now and again, you find somebody who's annoyed that uh, cars have a rotating livery. And this is this is mm-hmm. true. This is true in NASCAR as well as IndyCar. But I mean, that's that's the business model that you need to pay the bills. Nobody wants to shell out, um, you know, the amount of money you need to sponsor two cars with matching liveries for a full season. Uh, so you so you mm. so you thread. Why the, don't they? Huh? Why don't they? You say nobody wants to do it. Well, well, I'm getting I, pretty close with some of the teams like Penske, for example. But why don't you see that with some of the smaller teams? Because they're not getting their bang for their buck. Exactly. Uh, in with motorsports, because yeah, ratings are on the decline. Uh, you know, have to go this way. You're going to see it. Formula it, One held fast against it, but it, it's going to happen. It's it, it's going to creep into Formula One. You I, are. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Yeah, you are allowed a certain amount. I remember, and I don't know if it's changed recently. But I remember when I was with. Um, BAR Honda in the year 2005 or six. You know, we'd go to China with a special livery for the Chinese market with the cigarette branding. We well, know triple it was, five it was BAR that sparked that whole thing when they first. Yeah, when they had the they two cars. Yeah, car, yeah, yeah. And but I mean that wasn't changing throughout the season. And I, I, you know, it sounds silly, but I think it does fundamentally impact the viewing experience. You know, you watch a Formula One race. And you can watch the first race of the season and the last race of the season, and you know who you're looking at. You know, you know the Mercedes are silver or black or whatever it may be, and the Ferrari's red and McLaren's, you know, the papaya um, and all this sort of thing. But you watch a NASCAR race, and it's like going through a pack of Skittles trying to work out who you're watching. And IndyCar's not as bad, but NASCAR's really bad with that. You know, you lose that driver identity and that recognition and i think that's a really dangerous thing and i i wish it wasn't like that um but i mean i understand the 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 um economics of the deals you know you're not going to find many teams or many companies being able to sponsor a nascar team for 36 race and there's not many te- you know companies that are able to sponsor an indycar team for for however many you know, 15 races or so that they have if not more um and I've been, you know, we've spoken about this on this, this show before. And I, I think that the Indy 500, in a way, is sort of um, a blessing. You know, it's sort of a curse, in a way, to the uh, IndyCar series. Because there's so much attention and so much emphasis put on that one race that it sort of detracts from the other races a little bit. And I don't, I don't think you should get double points for that race. It's sort of... I. It's as important as any other race from a, from a, and I'm putting my engineering hat on here and my, you know, team member hat here. It's as important as any other race. Yeah, you want to win it, of course, but, you know, you want to win any race you enter. And it'd be interesting to see what you think about that if you, if you sort of share that opinion or at least, you know, can sort of follow that. Well, I do, I do think that the rotating liveries is, uh, it, it, it affects the viewership. It, it does it does cut off that connection that viewers have with, with a season long program. I think in, in IndyCar racing, it's, it's a bandaid over a more serious problem in the fact car never changes. And that it's like, here we are, you know, I see people posting pictures of liveries today and they're like, Oh yay, look at all these new liveries. And I'm like, well, yeah, but it's a four year old car, which is actually a 12 year old car. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and as, as the, you know, the purist as the racing enthusiast, that's what offends me. It's like, I want to see a new car. I don't want to see a new paint job. Yeah. Um, or, or I'd like to see a couple different cars in a track, you know, see Reynard and Alola 
you know, and a March, but instead we've got, everyone's got the same car. Yeah. We've got to accept that that's not going to come back. It's just, that's not going to change. That's just, well, I mean, that's the economics of it. That's, that's what keeps yeah. IndyCar. Actually, IndyCar is one of the more reasonable, reasonably priced series to get into if you're a team owner, uh, because oh, of yeah. so, but anyway, we, well, we've got a few, we got a few minutes left, so let's Richard. Yeah. You're our Formula One correspondent. So uh, Formula mm-hmm. One had their um, season opener. What did yep. what'd, what'd you think about it? I, I, I enjoyed it. It was a good race. You know, Bahrain for the third, third race in the last four. We're in, uh, out in Bahrain there. And uh, good to be back. You know, not much changed from last year, really, in terms of the pecking order. And that was to be expected, as we've discussed in previous episodes here, because of the technical regulations are or the, are pretty static, um, you know, going into um, 2021. The one thing you did see, though, is that the the new floor regulations, which had been designed to reduce the uh, amount of rear downforce by roughly 10 percent, certainly affected the <coughs> excuse me the low rate cars, uh, which were you know, predominantly Mercedes and um, what's now Aston Martin. Um, so your rake on your car is basically how high the rear end of the car sticks up in the air. And as with all these things, you can't just take, you know, a car and raise the rear end of it. Everything is designed around a common philosophy. And some teams, Red Bull, for example, have always had a high rake uh, on their car. And some years that's been detrimental to them. And it appears this year with the new era regulations, it's actually been beneficial to them. So it, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll take some time. Mercedes will catch them, I'm sure. But Mercedes did win the race. Uh, despite probably being two to three tenths of a second a lap slower from Hamilton compared to um, uh, Max Verstappen, there he, uh, you know, Hamilton, you know, did the business. Um, Max actually managed to get past Hamilton with what, about five laps to go there, but had to uh, return the position due to Max exceeding the track limits, which is a pet peeve of mine. Um, and I know the track limit issues at the exit of turn four in, uh, in, in Bahrain, of course, because that's the left-hand turn for a, you know, the turn four is a right-hand exit and there's a left-hand turn off to a, you know, a different layout, which was actually the one they used for the Secure Grand Prix at the end of last year. Um, so you can't put a gravel trap there or some sort of high friction surface, which would slow the car down and make the drivers not want to exceed the track limit. So if you do run wide there, you get the same amount of traction um, it, it may potentially even a slightly better exit there, uh, which is what um, Verstappen took advantage of and, and so had to give that position back and just was never able to to sort of make that move stick again, which... Right now, let me you know, just, I, just... Let's talk about this track limit for a second because I yeah. want to uh, just make sure I'm clear on the rule, okay? So if you... Okay. If you... Uh, I, I just read a stat and they said Lewis Hamilton, you know, went over the track limit 29 times. <laughs> yeah, but, but but when Max did it once, they're going to call well, them. Well, because but of course the, Max the, Max passed though, right? Yes, that, so, that's, so the, that's the. Am I, I corrected? Assuming so, if you don't improve your position, there's not really. A I think that the exact wording is if you if you receive a lasting advantage, which again is very vague. I mean, what does that mean in the grand well, scheme I, of things? Obviously, um, obviously, picking up a position is a lasting advantage. Of I, course, I would imagine I mean, qualifying right, so. the. And in qualifying, you know, they can just delete a lap time and you've got to do it again. And normally in a race, you'll have so many opportunities. And then after you've done it five times, you'll get a warning. Then after you've done it 10 times, you'll get another one, you know, and eventually you'd, you'd get some sort of penalty. But I'm, it is a pet hate of mine. And you see it with a lot of these modern, I'm going to use the word Tilka domes, you know, these Herman Tilka style tracks. Yes, that's, your, that, that's your favorite word, Tilka dome. Yeah. You know, they're just, God, they're just these vast wastelands of concrete. And um, where they need, you know, is at a wall. Nobody, you know, nobody has ever exceeded like track that. limits at Monaco. <laughs> you know, um, you don't, you don't see it very often. In a lot of tra- And I know they've got a, you know, you could put gravel there and of course that makes a huge mess and then, they, you know, it just gets messy and you've got to have some sort of limit there. But, you know, you know what these guys are like. If you spend any time around a racing drive and you give them somewhere that they can get an advantage, they will take that advantage. And it was, you know, 
the penalty would be a five second penalty. And Verstappen at the end of the race was like, I should have just kept that position and tried to pull out a five second gap. I'd rather finish second that way than than the way he did. Um, so I, I think they need to look at it. You know, it, it becomes either you know it's one thing or another. You and these cars are so advanced and the circuits are so advanced, they can put sensors in the track and they can say, look, you can do it three times in a race, exceeding a little bit, you know, you can exceed the track limits three times in a race. After that, we're going to start penalizing you. And they'd stop doing it pretty quickly, though. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now, John, do you get a chance to watch this Formula 1 race? I mean, you are you a big Formula 1 guy or? No, uh, yes, I did. Formula One is what got me into racing when I was a kid. Yep. You and I both, I right? Admit that in the last, certainly during this Mercedes era, I've lost interest. Um, <laughs> the Tilka drones and the same car and the same driver winning every race. But yes, I did watch the race. Um, I disagree with the perceived penalty on Verstappen I thought that he didn't go far enough off the track to make a difference I think that if you know they do need to start putting a tire wall or something in at, at places like yeah. that just, just put a curb I mean they could, they could bolt a curb in there that would shake the car yeah. to pieces you know they, they could do something and, and I think that I think that this particular track limits controversy it's going to come to a head in the next half season here because there's enough people upset about it now and especially yeah. at this point because let's face it a lot of people want to see anybody but lewis hamilton win races and for some i think you just want competitive races don't you yeah you do and and you know let's praise the guy i mean lewis hamilton won that race mercedes didn't win that race it was all yeah. down to the driver of that car so let's give credit where credit's due but the I, I think there's a, a sentiment among fans that people want to see other somebody other than Hamilton winning all the time. And when it comes oh, down sure. to a, a nitpicking, um, you know, hair splitting call like this, uh, especially a self-policing call like this. Yeah. You know, where Red Bull and it's an opinion, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it just it, it just it's a bad look for the sport. Um, yep. I thought it was a really, really good race. Um, when the race started, I said to my buddies that I watched it with, I said, there's a 60% chance that Hamilton wins this race. And it was down to yeah. the fact that I knew that Red Bull had a superior car. And I think that Verstappen is a, a quality driver at the level of or very close to Hamilton. But, um, but it, it's the Hamilton factor. And, yep. you know, you can you can criticize the guy for some of the things he says and does uh, because it <laughs> comes off as a bit tone deaf at times, but the guy can drive. And True. When and just, driving yeah. speaks for himself, he is the world champion seven times over. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I just wanted to sort of quickly go over a couple of the, you know, highlight a couple of the drivers, I think from, from this last weekend and, and a guy I think that got a little bit of unfair criticism heading into the weekend, I thought drove fantastically was Sonoda. Um, you know, young kid was was competent in the junior series, but there's there's plenty of guys that have had a equal or better junior career than he had, and has never made it through to to Formula One. And I, I think he's one of these guys that maybe with the slightly more powerful car, he's actually going to be better and he's going to be a little bit more disciplined than maybe he's been in that F two and F three career. That's but I thought he had a great Nicky Lauda effect. Remember, Nicky Lauda yeah. was a good Formula 3 driver, a good Formula 2 driver, and a great Formula 1 driver. Exactly, yeah. You know, sometimes their driving style just suits these big cars and these powerful cars. And, uh, you know, to score points and on debut there, the first debutant to score points since uh, Stoffel van Dorm. Um, again, back, back in Bahrain in, what, five years ago now, something like that, when he stepped in for uh, Alonso. Yep, five um, years ago. Yeah, so, you know, really, really good drive by him there. Um, a guy who'd moved teams, Sebastian Vettel there, I thought he had a uh, not a great weekend, got knocked out early in... in uh, a little, little in, miserable, yeah. yeah, that will, yeah he got that knocked out early in qualifying. Very Ferrariism of Vettel. That's why I'm going to refer yeah. to Vettel's shortcomings going forward as Ferrariisms. Yeah, I mean, he, he got hampered in, in qualifying by somebody we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, I want to talk about a little bit later, but 
you know, then he had that coming together with Ocon, and it was just, it just looked clumsy. And it actually reminded me of uh, Michael Schumacher in his final year with Mercedes when he uh, ran into the back of Bruno Senna in Spain, uh, which actually cost him a five place penalty at the next race, which actually was Monaco, where Schumacher got his final pole position but ended up starting fifth. Um, and yeah, Seb was just. I just, mm, I don't know how that's going to work. I really don't understand where his motivation's coming from. And I just think it's going to be a, it's, yeah, he's just going to fade away, I think, unfortunately. I think, um, you know, he he made the mistake of moving to Ferrari when he did, and it's just just not worked out with him there, unfortunately. Um, but then, you know, another guy I thought had a had a great race on the, on the counter side of that was Sergio Perez. Uh, you know, had a had a sort of control delete moment in uh, on the formation lap there, where his car completely died on him. Um, and it, it was interesting. I wonder if if that was a little bit of inexperience with the Red Bull systems on his part, and you know, he he defaulted back into the old um, racing point, you know, system that he'd been he'd known for the last six or seven years. And we were, I've seen it. I've worked with drivers in the past. Uh, that have, have pressed the wrong buttons on the steering wheel at the wrong time. Uh, Takuma Sato did it at Silverstone a few years when I was working with him, and uh, that, that didn't go down particularly well. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Sergio, uh, you know, Perez started at the back of the pack in the pit lane and drove fantastically to get up to was it sixth? I think he finished fifth or sixth. Fifth. He got um, fifth. Yep. Fifth. Yeah, I mean, fantastic. And that, you know, as I said to some of the guys here in, in our little group chat thing, that. In one race has proven his worth, and no disrespect to Alex Albon, but Albon would not have been able to do what Perez did. Um, I think in the first race, although he didn't finish protecting necessarily where he wanted to, it certainly highlighted that Red Bull have made that right decision in picking up um, Perez. Um, oh yeah, you know, for, I, for I, sure. I, when you when you want to talk about contending for the constructor championship, you need a guy. You know, a good second guy yeah. to pick up points. Absolutely. Yeah, and the yeah, guy that could overcome that adversity because it did look like for a moment it was going to be a did not start. Fortunately, he was yeah. saved by the bell and got it going. Yeah, you know, it, and again, unfortunately, you know, no disrespect to Alex Album because he's infinitely better driver than you or I. But he, I, I couldn't have seen it. if he had to start at the back. I, I, I he may have got twelfth or something. He may have been tenth. I, I certainly I don't think he would have finished where he did. Eleventh. Yeah, you know. He'd probably been a lap down or something, you know. Would have made uh, which, a couple mistakes too, as well. Yeah, you know. So I think that really highlighted Red Bull's decision making. I think Christian Horner and, and the group there will be, as I said, although the result probably wasn't what they wanted going into the race, he'd be he'll be ha- satisfied with what he saw. But somebody that does need highlighting, I think, and and you've got to give the guy a, a chance. But Mazepin was, um, yeah three yeah. corners into his Formula 1 debut and you look up into the back of the pack and you see a Haas heading straight towards the barrier again and it sort of brings flashbacks but that certainly wasn't a um, you know an unavo- you know, unavoidable incident, you know, it was just complete um, brain fade or whatever you know, I don't know. it's not easy it's, you know, I don't know how far not easy he through. got into I don't know how many what is it like three or four turns? I don't know how long is it. I'm pretty sure it's longer than Mark Marco's Apicella's Jordan run in Monza. But yeah, I mean you got two corners. You got into you got around two corners. And you know, you just has are in a difficult position. You know, they've got limited resources. They've basically said they're not going to develop the car this year. They're putting all the resources into the 2022 car. And they are, they are investing money, but the team's unofficially officially up for sale um and you know he's hasn't exactly helped himself with some of his off-track comments and behavior and again he's not exactly had a stellar career you know up to this point yeah he's been competent but he's not you know won championships and won countless races and there's certainly a lot of um financial backing i mean he came fifth in the formula two championship last year i mean it's not it's nothing to write home about, um, and I, yeah, I, I, I do, I do think he's going to struggle, and he's going to be one of these 
sort of paid drivers, I think. And at the end of the day, all Formula One drivers are paid drivers. I don't care what anybody says. But he's, you know, would he be there if his father wasn't the chairman of one of the largest oil companies in um, Russia? The short Probably answer, not. No. Yeah, yeah, I mean that that's a yeah, it's a direct no. Probably you know, so. not as being generous. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you yeah. know. All right. So we where where are we off to next? Uh we're off to Imola, I think it is in uh, mid April now. There's a bit of a break. It's what, a bit of a break probably? already, yeah. All right, well that'll be good. Yeah. Now uh yeah, Imola's a fun track. Uh now Louise, we've got just a couple of minutes left. So uh NASCAR on the dirt at Bristol. Let me put it bluntly. It was a mess. No, that's an understatement. The truck series, it seems like any amount of oil spill on the dirt track, they have to stop the race, even if the accident is obscured and minuscule. Like, I'm still, I still find it funny that Michael Walters said, oh, let's bring out a red flag after Andrew Gordon knocked over the sand barrels. Like, yeah, I come from the guy that knocked over two water barrels in his career and they didn't stop the race for it. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's that's a different story for another time, but Joey Logano and Daniel Suarez were definitely the two that stand out. It did help that in some aspects that Kyle Larson and Christopher Bell were involved in, in an incident that basically knocked them out of contention to fight for the win, but it opened up, got, opened the doors to guys that had little to no dirt experience. I know Logano ran a Volusia this last month in Florida, That's so he's got some dirt helm that might have probably paid dividends. He won the race after getting by Daniel Suarez with around uh, and led the final 61 laps in a row. And that and finally got that monkey off his back because Logano was a half a lap away from winning the Daytona 500. And after that, he's just haven't been able to capitalize on winning until now. But Suarez and that track house team, and I've said this multiple times through social media in the back of my head. I think what has helped track house, not just because they have the pitbull money, that does help, but also have the peep, the right people working with him. You got the brains of Justin Marks, and you also have somebody that has been involved in competition in Ty Norris, who helped DEI to where they were in the early 2000s before that whole 05 happened and everything went in straight into pieces. But overall, it was just a, a mess. I've heard a couple dirt riders that, that loves dirt racing are passionate to say that kind of racing was not good when it's all single file star. Other people love it because it reminded them of the old Bristol back in the day. For me, it was just a mess. And I just hope in next year's dirt race, they get it together. They improve on how to manage a dirt surface because when it, when it rain on Saturday, and when they try to run that half a lap at that truck, heat race they had a lot of they had a lot of improvements to make well that, that that was that was rather embarrassing when they tried to put the trucks on the track and then one lap in yeah nobody's got a windshield like a see-through yeah yeah that I was mean, I mean, again it's you know it's still uh it's it's a work in progress nascar has announced that bristol bristol will be on dirt again next year so uh, with this current car that we have right now they may have that may be the only race we'll see the gen six car that's what's being rumored. All right. So we are just about out of time. So where are we off to next to NASCAR land? Next week, not this coming weekend, but the following right, weekend yeah, East, East, Martinsville. East, East, Easter Sunday is coming up in March. And they're going to test rain tires at, at, Martinsville, Martinsville. at Martinsville this week. It'll be interesting to see if a flat oval can sustain a damp track. Um, again, you know, it's just more of trying to get the show in, but, uh, I'd be interested to see how the, uh, the test goes with rain tires in Martinsville. I mean, Martinsville, yeah, I wonder, I wonder how that, that's going to work. And that may be why they put pavement on that little grass that they had left in Martinsville. Because remember Martinsville used to have plenty of grass. Yeah. Yeah. And now there's no grass that upset at people because it did have a unique style. But after what we saw in the Xfinity race where somebody slid into that grass and poured dirt all over turn three. I get it, but it that's a different talk for another time as well about how people feel about that <laughs> payment, the new payment they added in the rumble strip. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Martin's Martin's was my old stopping ground. When I lived in Virginia back in the, back in the eighties and nineties, I would go to both Martinsville races every year and I always had the best time. I always really just enjoyed the Martinsville races. So uh, but anyway, so John Orivitz was our guest tonight. John, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, again, the book is called Indie Split. 
it's available through Octane Press. Uh, the other book is called Time Flies, A History of Pac West. Is that is that also through Octane? You can go to johnoreovitz.com and that's O-R-E-O-V-I-C-Z. Um, and you can order it direct from me and I will ship it to you and I will include a signed book plate from myself and Bruce McCaw. Fantastic. All right. So now, John, we can follow you on social media. On You're on Facebook. You're on Twitter. Um, do you have any other Instagrams or any of those other things that those young people like? I am on Instagram as well. And I think my handle is Indie Oreo, just like yeah. it sounds. Indie Oreo. Again, John, it has been fantastic talking to you. I've been wanting to get you on the show for a while. And I really want to thank you for joining us. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, Louise and Richard, I always enjoy talking to you guys, uh, but I want to thank the Hoobazoo Radio Network. I want to thank iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Google Podcasts, and YouTube, all those folks that carry us. But most of all, I want to thank you folks who listen to us every week. Uh, But until next week, good night. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O, that's who is it, I come. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O, that's who is it, I come.